quite a few people on the line. Thanks everyone for joining us. And congratulations on your recent awards. Uh, my name is Sari Schumann. I've met some of you through the, your initial meetings or in the past, and I co-direct the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. I'm joined today by Aaron Long of the Administration for Community Living, Kate Gordon, and Stephanie Hughes, also of the Resource Center. We'll get started in a minute with our presentation. I want to let you know that all the materials we review today, including the OMB data collection forms and related data terms and frequently asked questions, will be sent to you after the meeting in an email. And we'll also send a link to the NADRC website and the reporting calendar that we'll refer to a little later on. Right now, I will turn the presentation over to Aaron Long. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to put myself off of mute. <clears throat> um, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for taking the time to meet with us today and do our little orientation. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking um, about what we at ACL are doing, but we're going to get a great insight from the folks at the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center um, <clears throat> to uh, learn about some of the main activities of your grants. Um, I do want to take a minute to <clears throat> welcome you all. I'm assuming that at a minimum, your finance director, your program officer, um, and your finance officer maybe maybe may be on this phone, on this call. Um, we have, I just wanted to give you, um, so when you are communicating moving forward with your grants, we like that you would, we would like for you to communicate with your program officer. I'm uh, uh, not only ACL, a program officer, but I also am just the, te the team lead for all of ACL's Alzheimer's programs. Um, we do have two other program officers on our team that um, you may have assigned to your grant and you may have already met. That's um, Sarah Markell and Vijet Iyengar. And then we also have our, um, every grantee is assigned a program, a grants management specialist. We're fortunate to have Richard Adrian as our assigned grants man management specialist. If you have questions about um, grant solutions, um, the payment management system, things like that, Richard and finance issues, Richard is, is the person who will, and the expert who will be um, directing that any community will we'll direct you to him for communications on those things. I'm not exactly sure if he's on this call today or not, but um, if he is, uh, hopefully you will, um, he, he'll make us aware of his presence. Hi, Aaron. Um, just, just as Richard, just wanted to stop and say that I am here and wanted to say hi. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard. I was hoping that was, I ho we, we were hoping that Richard was you, but we didn't want to make oh, assumptions. Got so, it. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. And everybody know this is Richard. He's amazing. And he's a, a wealth of knowledge on all of the finance related issues. And as I said, we're very lucky to have him as our grants management specialist. As part of this grant, we also, and Richard is going to, we're going to, um, Richard's going to help us and host a a finance specific conference call um, a little bit down the road. Um, we also have the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center staff. Um, every grant is assigned a staff person and a partner. You probably, if you haven't had your conference call yet, uh, your orientation conference call with your team, your assigned team yet, you will meet that person in the near future. For next slide is, I just wanna go briefly over the cooperative agreement. Um, we do have cooperative agreements on this program as opposed to a traditional grant. For those of you that have had grants in the past um, that were just traditional grants, you'll learn that cooperative agreements provide for substantial involvement and collaboration with AOA and ACL in the activities. Basically, it's a partnership. We are going to be there with you from the start to the, the end. Um, and we have to agree on the things that you do that, that you change. And, and so um, we just, we work with you, we work as a team and you guys deliver it, but we um, participate in the planning and making sure that you to ensure that all of ACL's requirements are met. 
Um, and so next slide is about your, um, the grantee roles. Every team has two people that are named on their um, notice of award that you should have received. There's the authorized organizational representative. That is the person that has, has authorized you guys to submit an application. They are, um, they are the person that has the authority within your organization to obligate you to um, activities. So they assume the obligation to follow the law, ensure that you're um, in compliance, and they essentially are um, the, they provide oversight of the actual program director who's involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Typically, it's not the same person as the principal investigator or the project director, which is the day-to-day -day person who does the program reporting and the financial reporting. Or if they don't do all those things, they are the person that is having oversight of, over those um, activities. For the next slide, um, so you already have your notice of award, and that is um, the official document that is binding us together and, and, and gives the numbers, the, the, um, your award number, your match number, those numbers will not change over time. Um, so as we reconcile things, we'll always, the, the, award, the numbers on your award are the numbers that we're gonna um, go by, the, the dollar amounts. And this notice of award establishes our relationships. You'll see that there's terms and conditions that are in your award. Please make sure that you have reviewed them and make sure that, that you're um, starting your relationship with us um, with those terms and conditions in, in mind. Um, so the next slide is, um, so the steps that you're gonna take, you're gonna, we're, you're gonna review your notice of award, understand the policies and practices, um, establish your pay account and understand the reporting, all of the things that come with um, a new award. And um, the next slide is in relation to the payment. So the first time you take a payment that you draw down funds, that is basically your acceptance of all of the terms and conditions that are laid out in, in the award notice. So um, <clears throat> there, there are many um, conditions connected to uh, how you receive your payments. And, and I think that we'll go into the payment discussions more with Richard when we have the opportunity to have the group call with uh, the finance staff to answer any questions that may be coming up. Next slide. So you guys, when you made your applications, you had assigned a, the AOR, the uh, Authorized Organizational Representative, um, <clears throat> and the, the, um, the, pro, 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 the, the, the program officer or the principal investigator, whatever you're calling it, is that those people are named on your notice of award. Um, if those people, if you determine that those people, those names need to be changed, we would have to go through an amendment process. It's not just sort of a, oh, you decide to change and, and, and it's a done deal. You have to submit a formal request through grants, uh, grant solutions, which is the system that we run our grant program through, our grant reporting through. And um, then we can approve or disapprove whoever you know that person is. I've, I'm not familiar with ever disapproving someone, but it does. It is a process. It's a request. It's a letter. It's a resume, and um, you have to um, get approval to do those things. And then the same is true for the um, principal investigator. Next slide. So grant solutions is the systems that we do all of our grants management through. Um, typically when a grant is assigned, the AOR and the pro project manager do uh, get access to the, the system. If you need to get someone that say, is your person that handles administrative functions and, and maybe be the person that is the person that uploads reports or something and we need to get a third person access for administrative access, we can do that and um, you can go to the Grants Solutions help desk with all the information contained on this slide to um, 
access that and, and make sure and, and make the request to get another person um, authorized. Next slide. And I'm gonna turn it now to Kate Gordon. Thank you, Aaron, and welcome to everybody and congratulations on joining our team and hello, friends, including our friends from Kentucky who haven't seen us in a long time. So welcome back on board. So I'm going to spend some time walking you through those terms and conditions that Aaron mentioned in your notice of award. So some of these terms are not intuitive. So we're going to teach you the wording that ACL and the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center use when reflecting back on your notice of award. And one of these terms is the project planning phase. Now, I know all of you have had an initial meeting with your ACL project officer and your NADRC team lead and their partner to start to talk about this project planning phase, which all of you are in. This requires us to work together to revise your work plan basing it on what you included in your original application. You may have started walking through that original work plan with your NADRC staff and AD, ACL staff, but we know that we're gonna see significant changes in sometimes the format for those work plans, which we'll go over in a minute, but also um, you may be changing how you've worded your goals, objectives, et cetera. This is a long um, planning process as described in the notice of award and in the program announcement. So this is a six month period for many. I don't think I've ever had a grantee in the last six years who's made it in under eight weeks getting their revised work plan together. I think that's the fastest I've ever heard of. But we're going to work together to first revise your work plan. And then from your work plan, you will create a new evaluation plan based on that work plan. Again, with keeping the same goals um, and the essential items that you were approved to do by the federal government, but the way that we're, you're wording them is going to become much more detailed. As you've heard during these initial meetings, you only have access during this project planning phase to up to 15% of your grant funding. So this does mean that you can pay the staff who are working on your work plan and your evaluation plan. So if you've got your evaluator on board and they're part of this team, they can be part of those funds that you're expending at this moment in time. At the end of your project planning phase, when we're done with a work plan, evaluation plan, and oftentimes an updated budget to reflect some changes in your work and evaluation plan, you're going to have a closeout meeting to that. It's called the planning phase exit conference, where your project officer will give you verbal approval that you are ready to move on to the implementation phase. Aaron was just talking about grand solutions. Your project officer from ACL will also put a written note into your grants solutions account that says you have been approved to move to the implementation phase. The implementation phase is where the action happens. So it's where we're serving persons with dementia, we're training direct care workers, we're working hard with our partners. The implementation phase is through the rest of your project to the very end when you're working on your final report. Next slide, please. So your NADRC staff probably already talked to you about the fact that there are some existing resources that your the folks who've gone before you have been through this process before. We've created a webinar specifically called Writing an Effective Work Plan and Evaluation Plan. We know some of you saw this resource when you were writing your applications because it's clearly reflected in some wonderful starting work plans, but we ask you to please take the time as a team to go back and watch that webinar because you'll really hear that it is a very detailed process that you're about to go through. And we're going to ask you for more specifics than you've probably uh, thought you were going to write down on paper, but it's who's going to do what by when, which we'll get into in a moment. But on, there's this website um, that you'll get a link to. You'll have all of these slides for your use for the future. And when you go to this URL for writing an effective work and evaluation plan, you'll find a work plan template that is in Microsoft Word. You'll see sample work plans, work plan tips, which we'll go through today, evaluation plan tips, and a sample evaluation plan. We encourage you again, look at these materials, learn them, share them with all the staff that are going to be involved in writing your work plan and your evaluator. Next slide, please. So when you go to these resources, 
Here are some examples of what you'll see. At the top, you see a sample work plan. And this is the format they, that we request you do use. This is a Word document. It's the same uh, document that we're using in the Word format with all of our grantees. And we have over 70 right now. So if you're using a different format, it makes it really challenging for us as technical assistance staff and your project officers to be um, efficient in their time. So you'll see this format in the template and in the sample. We're asking you to really um, work hard on looking at your objectives, defining activities underneath those objectives. So how are you going to accomplish them? Everybody who's done a strategic plan in their lifetimes before has seen a process similar to this. We're breaking your activities into key tasks. We're saying specifically who is the person who's going to be responsible for those tasks, not the organization, but a human being. And then instead of having a work plan for every single year, our format asks you to show the full three-year trajectory on, um, in one format. So we don't have a 50-page document. We might have a 10-page document. That's the typical um, 10 to 15 pages is a, about the size of a typical work plan. The evaluation plan, you'll see that the wording is identical. There are objectives and there are activities. When it comes to who's gonna do the analysis, the data analysis and reporting, that may be your lead person. So a lot of the content that you'll be adding to your work plan and evaluation plan have already been populated just to copy and paste. Evaluation plan, also a Word document. Next slide, please. So there are a number of tips that you'll find on that webinar and in uh, the resources, but I wanted to go over a few of them that everybody is kind of bound by. First and foremost, when you're working on your work plan, ACL needs to be able to clearly identify where and how you're filling your gap areas. How are you focusing on behavioral symptom management? The example on the screen says that this group is going to deliver behavioral symptom management training and expert consultation to family caregivers. So therefore, the activities are then going to describe de delivering behavioral symptom management to family caregivers. So the activity the way that they're gonna deliver this is providing a training to community dementia caregivers. And the activities, we want you to be specific about the numbers of people who are going to be affected by your activity. So in this example, we have 300 caregivers who are going to be trained per year. Again, this is a three year trajectory on your work plan. So it says 900 total, ergo potentially 300 per year. Getting even more specific are our key tasks. These are where you're actually going to talk about hiring your staff. What months are you going to be working on hiring your staff, training your staff? When are you going to develop your memorandums of understanding with your partners and get your contracts signed with them? How are you going to um, organize your marketing and outreach? Those are under key tasks and sometimes under activities. Specifically, how and where will your programs be delivered? So in this case, the key task says we're going to organize periodic free one hour, real specific, one hour training for community caregivers. And it tells you what are the names of the trainings and who's going to provide them. This is also the area where we would specifically be looking for are you meeting the need that ACL has and that you've agreed to to provide evidence-based or evidence-informed interventions. We don't want to have to guess which intervention this is. So if you were delivering behavior symptom management training through Savvy Caregiver as an example of an evidence-based intervention, it would be in your key task or your activity, not usually your objective, but depends on your own program. So these are work plan tips. Next slide, please. So again, everything that's in your work plan Will be, a, will be in your evaluation plan with this caveat that's related to a direct service. All direct services, as you define them and your NADRC staff member works with you on defining and your ACL project officer agrees upon, direct services will be part of your evaluation plan. Your objectives and your activities are going to be identical to your work plan. There have to be defined outputs and or outcomes for each direct service activity. So if you're saying that you're going to train family caregivers as an activity and as direct service, you will have outputs, how many caregivers, outcomes. Well, what will that do for them? Will it decrease their stress? 
Will it increase their ability to provide care for longer? What outcomes, what's going to change in their lives as a result of you providing them that training? The outcome measures are where we then say, well, what scales are we going to use to show that we reduced stress? So there are a number of validated instruments that are out there. Many of you put uh, in your application what you were planning to use as your evaluation. But if you have an outcome, you have to name an outcome measure, even if it's one that you're developing yourself. So you don't have to always use uh, validated instruments, but you have to show those instruments as part of your evaluation plan time to ACL and the NADRC. If you have activities that are not related to direct service, you can put them into your evaluation plan, but they are not required. So those are activities like if as part of your grant, you're developing an advisory group, the number of meetings of your advisory group does not need to show up in your evaluation plan. If you said that your advisory group is going to be creating some kind of a tool that you're working on together, then perhaps that would be in your evaluation plan. So if you're creating a directory, or if you're creating a training together, that might show up as an output in your evaluation plan, but the number of meetings or the number of people in your advisory group, not so much. Same thing with a task like resource guide distribution. So that's part of your outreach more than it's part of the direct service itself. And taking time to do that distribution is uh, to the general public, for example, is not a direct service. And we'll get a little bit more into direct services in a minute. You have to be able to tell us in your evaluation plan how the data is going to be collected, who's going to collect the data, meaning the outcome measures or the outputs of these objectives and activities. And then at the very end, who's going to do that analysis and when is the analysis going to be done? We'll talk about semi-annual reports, but at least every six months, we are going to be asking you for the progress on your report. So typically every six months, somebody will be doing data analysis on your objectives and activities. The data analysis should be done by your third party independent evaluator. So we should see their name there. Next slide, please, Sari. All right, going a little bit farther into your notice of award, you read that you have required semi-annual and final reports. Sometimes we call these other things through the NADRC and ACL. So this is one of those times when you're learning our nomenclature, our language. We may refer to these semi-annual reports or final reports as program progress reports. Program progress reports are what most ACL grantees uh, perform. It's a four question uh, narrative report that's required of all what they call discretionary grants, which is what this program is part of. So we may call your semi-annual report a program progress report, or we may call it a narrative and data report. Those are all synonymous. Uh, we've been working on the project a long time, so sometimes we use shorthand for it. But these are semi-annual every six months, you're going to describe the direct services that you've provided during a six month period. So when did this start for us right now? So the date that your notice of award says your grant began, which was August 1st, August 1st through January 30th is your first six months. The first semi-annual reporting period for you is uh, August 1st through January 30th. Your first report is going to be due in February. Oh, I'm sorry. July 1st, thank you, Sari, July 1st. So you have a six month reporting period that starts from the day that you were approved for your grant, whatever your notice of award says for your date of approval. So at this time, when you're talking about what activities am I doing, you guys are all working on your planning process. So you are working on your work plan and your evaluation plan. There's a very specific format that you have to participate in or utilize as part of these semi-annual reports. You will receive a link to the semi-annual required report with those four questions that I mentioned, as well as the required Office for Management and Budget data reporting that my colleague Stephanie will go over in just one moment, which asks you questions about who was served, how did you spend your money? The things that you would find inside of your semi-annual report have to be related, again, to the grant that you've been funded to do. 
We don't need to know about your greatest fundraiser in the next six months. We don't need to know that you received an award. If you did, that's nice. You can put it in there, but you have to say that it was part of something that was not funded through the federal government. So please, even though you're enthusiastic, try to report just on the items that you've been funded to do that are in your work plan and evaluation plan. The semi-annual reports include things just for six months periods of time. So the first six months of your grant reporting period one, the second six months of your grant reporting period number two. So these are six, the semi-annual narrative reports are six months. Stephanie's going to go over our data reporting system, which is actually a cumulative reporting system. So from the date of your grant to the end of your grant, we should see your numbers increase over time in that data reporting. We should see your expenditures increase over time in that data reporting. It's a little bit different. Semi-annual narrative reports, only reporting on the last six months. OMB data reporting, cumulative from the beginning of your grant. Uh, Richard's on the line, and uh, he is part of our team who works on the federal financial reporting system. That's your SF-425s. You are required as part of your notice of award to submit those through the PMS system, also known as the payment management system. Those are done quarterly and annually. And as Aaron said, we'll have a completely different call for those of you who are the finance gurus for your organizations. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass it over to first to Stephanie uh, Hughes, who's going to talk to us about that data reporting system, and then to Sari Schumann, who's going to talk to us about the uh, dementia capability assessments. Thanks, Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Hughes, and I am also part of the Resource Center. And I'm going to talk with you for just a couple minutes about the semi-annual reports that Kate started to share with you about. So. Um, as Kate mentioned, the reports contain a narrative, and that part is focused on the activities that occurred during the most recent six-month period of your grant. And the template that you'll use for the narrative portion of your report is included as a link in your previous slide. Um, your report will also include a data spreadsheet that shows the cumulative numbers of people that you've served and trained over the course of the entire grant. So each time you submit the data spreadsheet, it should be showing the total numbers across the grant project. Uh, the numbers do get submitted on a standard OMB approved spreadsheet. And each time you submit the spreadsheet, you should be filling out all fields when you um, send in the data. And if that's a zero, which it may very well be in the beginning in terms of the persons you've served, um, that is fine, but go ahead and fill in a zero there. Next slide, please. So I wanna just do give you a brief look at the types of data that you're required to collect and report on in the spreadsheet. The first category is information related to the people with dementia and caregivers that you're serving and the demographics of those groups. Um, so just some examples of those demographic categories that you'll collect include race, gender, age, and whether the person with dementia lives with a caregiver. The second data category within the spreadsheet is a count of the number of professionals that you've trained. Um, in this case, we do ask that you count unduplicated people trained. So if someone is attending um, more than one training, they're just counted as one person trained. And actually I should say the same is true for people with dementia and caregivers who are served, you should be reporting unduplicated numbers there if somebody is receiving more than one type of service through your grant. Um, the third type of data that you'll report are direct service units, um, which is essentially a measure of the amount of time that you're devoting to each client or person that you're training. And finally, you'll report on your expenditures, and that's where you will break down the funds that you have spent to date for your grant into percentages to show the percentage that you have spent on direct services, the percentage that you have spent on administrative functions, such as reports or contract development, and the percentage that you've spent on other programmatic costs, um, like some of your program planning time. So these are the general categories of data that you're going to be collecting and reporting on the OMB data collection form. Next slide, please. This slide um, is just to give you a snapshot of, um, give you a sense of what the data collection form looks like. 
Um, there is a lot of information we know to absorb in today's presentation. And so we're not going to review in detail how to complete this form, but I do wanna make you aware that we do have another resource related to how to fill out the OMB form and how to collect that data. Um, so there's a link to that video here. And I would recommend that as you get to the point in your planning process where you're going to be working with your evaluator on the evaluation plan, um, that would be a good time to review the video and just make sure that you're really familiar with the data requirements, how to define the different data categories so that you can be creating data collection forms and processes that will fit in with your project requirements. Um, and in that same regard, I also want to draw attention to another resource, which is the OMB definitions and FAQs document. Um, I believe Sari mentioned that that's also going to be sent out as an attachment as a follow up to this call. Um, but grants often have questions about things like what counts as direct service, how to calculate expenditures, that sort of thing. And that document is a great resource for definitions and guidance. Um, of course, your TA lead through the Resource Center and your project officer at ACL um, are also here to help you with any of those kinds of questions that come up. Next slide, I'm gonna turn it back to Kate. Thanks, Stephanie. So building on Stephanie's description of what's in this OMB required document, we wanted to talk about these different expenditure categories. So Stephanie quickly talked about the direct services and what counts as direct service. In the third tab of this OMB required worksheet, you will be laying out what percentage or how much uh, of time has been spent in providing direct services, administrative functions, and other program expenses. So this is all about how are we spending our money. So an example of the use of time and funds for direct service include behavioral symptom management consultations for caregivers, professional trainings, so that could be direct care workers, physicians, nurses, et cetera. The time that you spend in providing evidence-based or evidence-informed interventions and or respite. Now, this is not exhaustive in what all of the direct services could be, but we're talking about ways that we are spending our time, talent, and treasure to serve persons with dementia and their caregivers. That's the direct service component. You'll spend a significant amount of your time during your work plan development outlining what are direct services. So we'll be able to tell from your work plan and then see in your delivery of our OMB worksheet how much time and how many funds were spent on direct service. We also have these other types of activities that we do and ways that we can spend our money. So expenditures can be made for administration, uh, administrative tasks. So this includes writing these semi-annual reports that we're talking about, routine grant administration and your grant specialists at your organization's time, monitoring of the contracts that you have with your subcontractors or your partners, contract development with those individuals and monitoring of those, those are administrative functions. So sometimes your grant specialist might be working on that within your organization. Sometimes your project director might be doing that. Sometimes your staff on the project. So if you have a social worker who's a part of this project might be helping you write a couple of paragraphs for your semi-annual report. That would show up as administrative time. Then there's a bucket of expenditures that we just title other program expenses. These are things that you're working on right now. All of this time that you're spending on your work and evaluation plan development and your budget redistributions, this is part of the other program expenses. So all of your time in development right now is until you're approved to move to implementation, uh, for the most part other than setting up your MOUs, is other program expenses. A lot of you are creating new training curriculums for caregivers or direct care staff or others. The development and the time and development for those curricula are in other program expenses. It is not direct service until you actually provide that training. So any consultative services that are helping you to create a curriculum, that's part of other program expenses. Until the moment where your staff is out on the street actually providing those hours of training, it's not direct service. Outreach and marketing, 
trying to recruit people to your programs, that's also other programmatic expenses. And lastly, the large chunk of your evaluation activities is considered other program time. So that could be your evaluator, or it could be the time that your staff is spending collecting um, surveys that your program participants are filling out. Those are all other programmatic activities. Of note, you have to report all of these as a percentage of the total grant funds. So when ACL said 50% of grant funds have to be spent on direct services, that's 50% of your entire budget. That's not 50% of the government funds. That's 50% of the funds that your organization has put on the table as well as what you receive, what you're receiving from the federal government. So the total approved budget on your notice of award is what we're talking about when we're talking about total grants funds spent. And this 50% um, will increase over time. So in your first year, you may only be spending 10% of your direct services, but it's the cumulative number that we're talking about. Your 50% of your total approved budget has to have been spent by the day of your last, um, the last moment of gasp of air in your grant period. It's 50% of those total funds spent to date. So cumulative. Next slide, please, Sari. And for me, lastly, it's some tricky terminology. I just talked about direct services. These concepts can be confusing if you've never had a federal grant before. Uh, you're, again, 50% of the total grant funds have to be spent on direct services, serving persons with dementia, their caregivers, or others who are directly serving persons with dementia and their caregivers. The Direct service requirement, as I mentioned, has to be tracked over time in your semi-annual report and in that OMB form. Your match is different. The match is what you guys said that you were putting on the table as requirement of 25%, either cash or in kind, to be participating in this project. Um, and you can use matching funds that, that don't that are not direct services. So match does not have to be a direct service. Match could be to support administrative services or other program expenses like office space, printing costs. If your organization is picking up those and doing the printing on behalf of the grant, then that could be counted as match. The person who knows best what counts as match are the two people, um, Richard, as well as your project officer. So your grants management specialist at ACL and your project officer are the people to talk to about match. Direct services, you're going to talk to your NADRC lead as well as your project officer. So the people who talk to you about these different things are uh, just a little bit different, but your project officer is involved in both sides of these. All of these direct services, again, anything that you're counting as direct service has to be reflected in your work plan. And then again, in your evaluation plan. Your match is separate from this and is not reported on in the OMB semi-annual report. Thank you, Sari. Great, all right, thank you so much. So as you all know, it's critical that grantees, that ACL Dementia grantees are building dementia capability into your programs in partnership with the key agencies in your communities. And at the onset of the project and annually thereafter, and at the close of your project, grantees and their partners are required to conduct an assessment of the dementia capability of their existing systems. So we have a dementia capability assessment tool that will include questions related to a number of areas like identifying people living with dementia and their caregivers, staff training on dementia topics, and specialized services for people living with dementia and their caregivers. When you assess the dementia capability of your system, it will allow you to create metrics for use in future service program evaluations, and it can be a basis for setting goals, objectives, and milestones for program monitoring and reporting throughout your grant period. We complete the assess, or you'll complete the assessment annually in an effort to track your program progress toward enhanced dementia capability and document your progress toward systems change. So this will help you um, ensure that at the conclusion of your program period, you can document this progress by reporting on the aspects of the project that were successful, those that were not, and the lessons learned. So we will move to the next slide. Um, on the slide in front of you, you see this is what the online dementia capability quality assurance assessment tool will look like when it is sent to you by the resource center staff. 
this online format allows you and your direct service partners to complete the assessment. And I would say the average is about 10 minutes. The Resource Center developed this tool and um, your assigned TA staff person, myself and Maddie Murray, who's also on our staff, will work with you to determine which grant program partners should complete the assessment. After you as the grantee provide us the names and email addresses of all respondents, each respondent will get an individualized link to complete the assessment. The Resource Center will manage the dementia capability assessment process, including collection and analysis of the data. Your third party evaluation team does not need to be tasked with this aspect of the work. We will send you your um, responses when everyone has completed the assessment. When you had your initial meetings with your TA lead partner and the ACL project officer, you heard about this assessment in detail. Um, and I'm just going to review a few points about that here. This is the, what you're seeing in front of you, the first question page for the assessment where you're just filling out information about the organization completing this, um, this tool. Keep in mind, this is an organizational assessment. This is not what is Sari Schumann's dementia capability? This would be what is um, your organization's dementia capability? So someone at the organization who's knowledgeable about all the activities of the organization can complete the tool. They can also consult with others at the organization to make sure they are answering accurately. So who is completing this assessment? I've already talked a little bit about this, but every single AT ADPI grantee organization will complete the assessment. The project partners that should be completing the assessment are those that provide direct services or supports to people living with dementia or their caregivers as part of this grant project, or those who employ professional staff who are receiving dementia-related training as part of the grant project. The partners that do not complete this the assessment are evaluators, or those who are only providing administrative support during the grant project. You can also keep in mind, some organizations are involved in more than one ADPI grant project as grantees or partners. They will complete one assessment at each required assessment time. If the amount of time that elapses between their um, assessment that maybe they take today and they're not asked again to complete it for more than three months, they will need to complete it again. That doesn't typically happen since we do it annually, except at the start of a grant period or the end. Um, and we can talk about that on an individualized basis if that applies to you or your project. So you um, may have been part of our uh, webinar series this week when we had a webinar on Tuesday and you are invited to and to attend all of the NADRC facilitated webinars. They all focus on dementia related topics and are archived in the webinars and training section of the NADRC website for your viewing if there's something that you missed or would like to take a look at um, now that you have a grant project. This is the front page of the NADRC website, which houses many resources for grantees and collaborative partners. There are um, various tabs that you'll be able to look at as you browse the website. You can find our reports and resource guides. You can find um, program tools that we use, such as the OMB reporting tool. We'll be sending out the link to that and to the data, data terms and FAQs as well. And as I just mentioned, we also have webinar recordings on the website. It's a great place for you to take a look at, get familiarized with what's on there so that you can find resources easily when you need them and your resource center staff person and ACL program officer are also always willing to help you find what you need. So for more information, you already know your TA lead for your project, so you can contact that person. You already know your ACL program officer, you can contact them. 
Um, if you have not met them for some reason, you can contact Aaron or myself in the interim and we will connect you with um, your TA lead or program officer. So we have made it to the point of our presentation where we are going to be able to take some questions from all of you. So um, you can put those questions in the chat feature or we are able to um, unmute everyone's lines so that um, if you raise your hand, we can hear from you directly. So uh, Shane, I believe you are able to help us with that. I'm gonna stop the share so we can more easily see everyone. It looks like, let's see. Um, so we did have a question come in about data sources that can be used to determine role participants. And Stephanie is gonna go ahead and answer that question. Yeah, thanks. And I apologize, I've had some background noise here, so hopefully it won't interrupt my answer. But um, no, that's a good question. And I think um, there are kind of two parts to the answer when you're thinking about how to determine those categories. Um, the first thing I would say is, um, start with the definitions in FAQ's document because that's going to give you um, what specific definition the federal government uses in terms of those categories. So in this example, if you're looking at urban versus rural, the definition of urban given is a central place and it's adjacent densely settled territories with a combined minimum population of 50,000. So it's pretty specific. Um, so that's where I would start in terms of the definition. But the other thing I would say about this when you're getting to the point of collecting data from your participants is that they are going to be the ones who are um, identifying which category they fit into. So um, whether it's on a paper form or whether you are collecting this information from them verbally, you can use those definitions to help inform how you are explaining the categories to them. Um, but ultimately, they are the ones who should be indicating, for example, you know, what race and ethnicity categories they would identify with. That's not something that you will be determining for them. And there's a lot more information about that in the training about the OMB data collection form as well. Thanks, Stephanie. Does anyone else have questions? I don't see raised hands right at this time. Or Aaron, if there's anything you wanna add um, to what Stephanie said, that would be great. Nope, I'm, I'm good with what you said. Okay, great. So we'll give you all a few minutes to think of any questions. Um, you can enter them in the chat box like we mentioned or raise your hand um, using the directions Shane provided in the chat feature and um, happy to answer any of those. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Yeah. In here. the interim, I would just say, you know, we're giving this opportunity to ask questions now, but um, it's not speak now or forever hold your peace. It is gonna be a iterative process where we're gonna all be asking questions back and forth. So um, don't feel that we're trying to compel you to ask questions now. Will be there'll be lots of time for questions and answers as we move forward. So a question just came in um, that Richard, you might be able to answer. When you do the finance call, or will you be able to provide example MOUs um, for partnering agencies? Or is there a standard format that you'd be able to point people to if that's required? So I'm assuming they're referring to MOUs between the uh, lead agency versus subcontractors. Um, ACL is not really privy to um, that relationship. Uh, we leave it up to grantees uh, to uh, manage that relationship based on their own uh, policies, internal policies, as well as those of 45 CFR 75, which is uh, the, uh, basically the policies that everyone at HHS should be following. Um, we don't monitor that closely, but we leave it up to grantees to be in charge of that. And again, it should be in compliance with their own internal uh, policies. Great, thank you, Richard. The only thing I would add to that would be that, you know, make sure that 
you keep those records of, of whatever your pol whatever the MOU is for the duration and the, the required period for retaining records after you're done. Um, we can certainly, we certainly, we don't get into the grant relationships or the, the partner relationships, but um, we're also always happy to um, help grantees talk through the kinds of things that they need to consider when they're um, developing a relationship with an organization and the things that they might wanna consider putting in their MOUs. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I wanna ask about getting contact information for the other grantees. Um, we will be in the process over the next few months developing program profiles for each of your grant programs where contact information will be included. Um, you also do have the contact information for everyone. You should in the uh, meeting appointment from today. If there is, um, we, can, we can talk amongst ourselves if there's a reason that we wouldn't do that. We've never really sent out a list, but it's something that we can um, consider doing and sending out contact information for everyone. I think we have, well, we also have our list serve that right. we, for, for our um, each cohort. Um, and I think that you'll find that over time as we, we don't really get into um, getting people together when they're still trying to figure things out in the beginning, but as uh, programs become more developed um, and um, grantees have aligned activities that they can benefit from each other, we have many cluster calls on certain topics or regions or on, on a broad, broad variety of, of categories that we will bring people into. And obviously, if you hear about something that um, there's a list, there was a press release of, of the grants uh, that were awarded. And if there's something that you're interested in, you're welcome to ask your program officer to see about getting with them. Great, thank you. Any other questions that folks have at this time? Just as an errata, I'm gonna post for you guys the first semi-annual reporting period in the chat so that you get your my dates correct. Thanks, Kate. So this includes both the narrative and the OMB reporting that Stephanie and I went over. Go ahead, Mike. You want to unmute yourself? Yep, I think I just did. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I, I knew you probably wanted somebody to at least ask a question, so I figured <laughs> I would ask one for you. Okay, go for okay. it. Um, I just a little bit of a hypothetical. So as we put the grant proposal together, the, the direct service was a little challenging for us to, to really understand that and ensure that we hit, which I, I believe we've, we've well over the 50%. But as we work through this and better understanding the direct service, um, like for example, training, uh, we are gonna be doing a number of training programs in different areas for behavioral symptom management training, for other training in the IDD communities. Um, and you know, if, I mean, I'm assuming as we go through this work plan, if we find that we may need to do more of the direct training to make sure we hit that 50%, that's like, that would be an example of an adjustment that we would need to make. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. So basically the planning period is the plan, is the time that um, you figure out the things that you, the assumptions you made and you've learned things since, you know, it was a long time ago, you did your application. Now, you know, you may have learned, thought of things like, what was I thinking? Why did we put that in our application? Or we didn't know about something and we, at, we, we wish we had put it in our application. But also it's important to understand that um, we're, you're gonna be building their work and evaluation plans to um, in, in time. So if, if, you tur if it turns out you need to find uh, more direct services or, or things that you hadn't thought of as direct services or vice versa, things that you thought were direct services that they're not like outreach or that will help you work through those. You, us, the project district officer and the TA will help you work through what is and isn't and where we're very good at um, helping you find things that you may not have thought of that 
um, okay. would count as direct services. And then just as a follow up, that's helpful. Thank you. And that's what I kind of assumed, but I just wanted to clarify. And then um, so that may also then require some movement of, of uh, some, whether the funds, either ACL funds or the in-kind cash or in-kind non, we might need to move some of those numbers around then I would assume. And that's all part of that process too. Exactly. So when, as we go through the planning phase, you're going to do your work plan, then you're going to do your evaluation plan, and then you're going to take those two documents and make sure that your budget aligns with them. Okay. So, so then okay. that, that will be, I mean, you can't, you can't change the whole project of what you were reviewed on, but you'll have right. a lot of opportunity to make those adjustments to make sure that nobody gets a hundred percent on these things. But what, what we hope for at, at the end of the planning period is that people are as close to hundred percent of meeting all of our requirements in your project as you start getting ready to um, really start implementing something. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Any other questions? I've got one. Go for it. Can you hear me? I don't sound yes, like the, um, I don't sound like the you know, Charlie Brown teacher. This is Stephanie Shivers. Um, nice to see some familiar faces on the call. Um, and I hate to even bring up the elephant in the room or the, the mask in the room. Um, as far as the pending and ever present um, COVID, should we, how should we be thinking about or planning for or not planning for or considering um, flexibility or pending flexibility for future iterations. Any recommendations on, on that going forward? So we've been doing it for a while now. And um, what we've told our grantees in the past, when, you know, obviously we had a bunch of grants that were um, planning to do a lot of things in person, COVID hit, and then the, everybody had to pivot. I would say that make a best guess estimate of, of, of what um, you think is a realistic expectations in terms of the services that you'll be able to deliver in person or virtually. Um, if you think that, um, I think most of these proposals all would have had some consideration of COVID-19 and how that's impacted their ability long-term to deliver services. And, and frankly, some have realized that, that there's a, a benefit to having those and, and, and coming up those virtual services and coming up with methodologies to do hybrids and things like that. So you can work with your project officer to um, make a long-term, it's a long-term plan. And then if, if you need to adjust course over time, you have the flexibility to do that. Just make best guess and, and know that we'll work with you to pivot to um, meet the needs of your community. Erin, may I add on just about evidence-based, evidence-informed interventions in the context of COVID? Right. <laughs> sure. So Erin um, said we've been doing this for a while. One of the things that we do request as TA and at ACL is to make sure that you're talking with the original developers of your evidence-based or evidence-informed interventions if you can contact them. We had at least one interventionist say that it was not appropriate to move their intervention from in-person to online. So just keep in mind that there's input from those developers that should be weighed um, and the discussion can include uh, should include your TA as well as your project officer, but we have had examples of people saying no. Great, thank you. Well, we are just about out of time. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Like Aaron said, this was just one of many opportunities over the next three years where we will get together and answer questions. We're available um, whether uh, you contact us, but please also contact your TA lead and your ACL project officer when you have questions. Um, like I mentioned, we will be sending out to the listserv um, for this uh, most recently awarded grant group, um, the resources that we talked about today that will come to you this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So I wanna thank you all for joining us and um, we will definitely be in touch over the next three years. Take care, everyone.